echo chamber here. We're still waiting. Yeah. I think did we just start? Yeah, okay. I have my uh, the little clock here. It tells me when it starts, so I guess we can already start. But okay. Still working to get the acoustics right here, so hopefully you'll bear with me as uh, we chat tonight and do what we got to do. Uh, hopefully we will not be too loud or too soft. So what can I say? But anyway, I've got a very, very important topic that I want to share with you that obviously affects us all. And that's the topic of the reality and the existence of evil. For those of you who don't know, here at the Kosher Door School, I've been a pastoral counselor. That means, you know, I, I try to help people with different things in their lives. I've been doing this, gosh, close to 30 years now. Uh, I took a number of number of courses back in the day at uh, the Yogi Institute of uh, Analytical Psychology back in New York. And that very much inspired uh, my pretty much the direction of everything that, that I do in trying to understand things. I mean, it, it's a complementary school and what we learn in our Kabbalistic traditions. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the writings of Eric Fromm and Victor Frankl, two social psychologists who, in my opinion, have a tremendous amount of wisdom to offer in their books. And I can't encourage you enough to read uh, either one of those authors, Victor Frankl's uh, uh, book on the search of meaning, uh, Eric Fromm, his book on you shall be as gods, which is his understanding of psychology of Judaism. Very, very profound teachings. Uh, love, him, love him very much. And Jung, well, you, you gotta be a scholar to be into Jung. But when we're talking about the reality of evil, the reason why I'm bringing down the psychology stuff is because it's very important that when we talk about evil, we've got to identify it correctly. We in the world of religion live literally in a world of mythology. And that's pretty much the worst way possible, meaning make believe in fantasy. A lot of people believe a lot of things that were written in ancient texts that were never meant to be literal, but if you will, literary or poetic, et cetera, and so on. Many of the teachings and the discussions, both biblical and of course, extra biblical, are literature. And when you read literature, you have to understand the genre of literature in order to properly understand what the literature is trying to relate to you. So, for example, I'm sure we're all very familiar with the biblical book of Job. The story of the sufferings of Job always bothered me. I couldn't understand the morality of it. Even Carl Jung had a big issue with that and wrote a whole book on it called Answers to Job. But there's a point that's made by our sages, embraced by Maimonides, which I've come to the conclusion I agree with. Job is not a historical record. It's a biblical novel. It's a story. Most likely meaning there was never a historical person of Job or anything of the kind. It was a story written to teach a moral lesson, a very, very profound moral lesson. So again, this is Maimonides talking, this is Gemara, so this is this is as authentic Judaism as you can get. Many of you might not like that, but what can I say? It's important that when we come to this type of literature, that we recognize it in that respect. Many of the mystical schools like books like the Zohar. The original name of the Zohar was the Midrash of Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, for those of you in the Judaic world, you know the word Midrash means stories, embellished tales. The Midrash of Shimon Bar Yochai was not written as an historical record. It was written novellically to teach many things. I am of the school that believes that the Zohar was not historically written by, or any connection to, the actual historical person of Shimon Bar Yochai, but as of later origins. And that's a topic for another time. Uh, my research on that, 20 years in the doing, and if I wanted to write one of those big 500 page books on the topic, I think I could. Um, I just don't care why. 
Because I think the story that's, that are related in the Zohar are beautiful and valuable. Just like the story of Job. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is what's the message. When we want to come to an understanding of evil in the world, we have to understand what's the message. What's the reality? So, for example, again, getting back to our concept of novella and Midrash in Judaism, out of the Midrashic teachings was developed the concept of the Satan. Yeah, we read about this individual in the book of Zechariah and, of course, in Job. But most people do not recognize that the nature of the Satan in biblical Judaic teachings is radically different from how it was later interpreted and embraced in Christianity and Islam, both of which came out of Jewish Midrash. They are the ones who took our symbolism and took it literally and therefore created the entire scenario of the devil, Satan, being an independent evil opposite of God with his own domain called hell, who's out to, to duke it out for eternal uh, dominion of your souls. And he's got this whole army of like little devils out there, you know, the little red guys who take horns and pitchforks and they're out to get you. Well, that's Midrash. In other words, it's make believe, it's fantasy. It is not what the Bible teaches. Now, that's a very important point because our mythology in the Western world and deep in the most you know, of the world believes in this duality between good and evil and duking it out. And it's just not really the case. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7 says it very clearly. These are words which those of you familiar with the Torah observance of the evening prayers Mariv might be familiar with these words. Yotzer Or Ubare Hoshech forms light, creates darkness. For those of you who know Kabbalah, you know the word Bore is of a higher dimensional plane than Yotzer. So darkness is about higher order than light. Ose Shalom, from the word makes peace. Ose, the lowest word of Ubore and creates again a higher level. In the prayer book, it says, Et ha kol, creates everything. But the original verse in Isaiah 45 7 says, Ubore ra. God creates evil. Evil exists. Does God perpetrate evil? No, that's something different. Evil exists as byproduct, if you will of a lack of consciousness, a lack of awareness, an imbalance, a lack of light. Remember, we use words like light and darkness. We're not talking about the sun and the moon. We're not talking about light bulbs or the lack of it. We're talking about intelligence and enlightenment. So when I try to share with you these things specifically to separate between the literal and the poetic, it's important that we recognize things and embrace these truths so as to increase light. That's what enlightenment means. Being aware of, sensitive to, and embracing that which is truth. So putting all the fantasies of good and evil aside, we want to talk about the reality of evil. What exactly is it? Answer? The choices that we as human beings make. Think about this as a question for you now. Where does evil exist? And I'll, I'll give you a multiple choice here. A, inside the heart and mind of human beings, or B, in nature itself. I know many of you are going to run and jump and say, yeah, it's in nature itself because the devil's out there, and all the spirits out there, they're all evil. Are they now? Are there, in quote, evil spirits? Well, yeah, they probably are. But I'm talking about nature itself, not entities in nature. Is nature evil? No, I don't think we can say that at all. 
people get struck by lightning. You have tsunami tidal waves that wipe out a quarter million people. That's evil. No, that's natural. Mother Nature, the Shekhinah, Gaia, all kind of same thing, is not evil. She's natural. Nature can indeed be cruel by our human standards. Is electricity good or evil? Well, when you want to cook your dinner for the Sabbath tomorrow night, you're going to use an electric stove. I think you would think it good. But if you're the type of individual who poses a death penalty, then you might think the electric chair is bad. It's a matter of perspective. But is the electricity good or evil? And the answer, obviously, is neither. So what makes something good or evil is its application. And applications are subjected or subjective and subjected to human thought and human consciousness. So therefore, it's the power of mind which creates evil. Now, we've discussed the power of mind many times in many classes, in many a place. My entire book, Protection from Evil, which I, I ran out of hard copy, all we have available now is the ebook. It's readily available. You can order it from me. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's only a, a $10 item. I cannot encourage you enough. Please read it. I was inspired to write a book on spiritual self-defense from a book that I myself read way back when in the day when I was studying a lot of these things. It was written by famous uh, British occultist, The Fortune, called Psychic Self-Defense. She had a lot of good stuff in there. She really did. I was, I was, I've always liked the book, and uh, I still do. But it was still dealing in that mythical realm of things. And I thought we really needed to bring things down to earth. And that's why I wrote my book, to try to strip away the mythology and to get down to, if you will, the brass tacks of how things really need to be. Because bottom line, we're never going to wave a magic wand and make the world a better place. But we can make our individual lives better. We can learn how to protect ourselves from evil by learning how to protect our minds and thereby our hearts, our emotions, and thereby our actions as well. So understand that the power of mind goes far beyond the limitations of just the imagination inside the skull holding your brain. We believe, well, we, we use, I use the word mind, sechel in the Hebrew, as being synonymous with what we would call the neshama, or the soul. Now, let's not argue about the different levels of soul, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. I don't have to deal with those details. Let's just understand that the mind and soul transcends and is not limited to the organic physical brain. This is something that has been known in religious and mystical circles forever. Every mystical religious circle pretty much. And even modern science in the uh, taboo studies of parapsychology eh, becoming very well aware of this too. You've heard of government studies and like the security fields where in which they'll hire people for like doing remote viewing and things like that. And they'll have these programs going for decades. And then they'll close them down and say, oh yeah, nothing ever came of it. Really? You wasted like millions of dollars over decades over nothing? I think if nothing was there, you would have figured it out a whole lot quicker than 20 years. So there's a lot more going on there. For those of you who want to do some interesting uh, uh, investigation of, of the power of the mind and, and, and psychic investigation and remote viewing, I could recommend it to you pretty much anything written by a man named Ingo Swan, I-N-G-O-S-W-A-N-N. He's got a lot of very interesting stuff. He's got a couple of videos on YouTube, well worth your investigation. But understand now, good and evil, they do exist, very much so. But they are the existence of the human mind.
or the human soul. The human mind and the human soul, which is not limited to the boundaries of the organic brain, which means that we have the power through thought to project from the minds of one into another. Because that which we believe is mind is not something finite and limited. But gosh, the only way I know how to describe that which we call mind is using the language of the RE. When he again refers to this as souls, he says all human souls were included in Adam Arishon, in Adam. The Adam we speak about in the Bible, Garden of Eden stuff, that Adam wasn't the man. A, a physical human being. He was a symbolic representation of all humanity. And as such, each and every one of us is just, if you will, an individual cell in the body, the greater body of all collective Adam, which I might add are all human souls, not all of whom are incarnate in human bodies. Human souls, we believe, can be incarnate many other forms on our planet, or for that matter, other worlds as well. The words that the Ari says is Olamot. Now, if you're talking about other worlds, that might very well mean other planets in our physical space or in other dimensions. So therefore, if we are all connected as individual cells of a greater whole, we have that quantum entanglement, where in which what influences one affects the other. This is how psychic powers work. This is how Ruach HaKodesh works. This is how prophecy works. This is how both blessings and curses work. This is how prayer works. This is how Kavanot in prayer works. We project from one place in the collective body to another. And being that this is the reality, place one influences place two. So for example, here we are communicating literally around the world and through time, through this electronic means of this video that is now gonna be on the internet. At this time when I'm recording live, I'm on Facebook, we will copy this video and upload it and it'll be on YouTube. So you who are watching this video now, you can be with me live on Facebook or listening to this recording on YouTube. For my private students in our kosher Torah school, I even uh, take the audio out and I give them an audio version. You're listening to that. Why am I saying all this? I just want you to know that I'm thinking of you right now. You might be watching this five, 10 years down the line. I'm thinking of you right now because you and I, wherever we are disconnected in space and time are still connected through the neshama, through the greater soul of Adam, through the power of mind. And therefore, when we cultivate the strength and power of mind, we have the power of influence. So therefore, as I am thinking of you, I am projecting through my thoughts positive energy, powerful energy, healing energy, that somehow in some way, some words that I might speak somehow might have some significance to you as an individual that I hope and pray can make your life better that might answer some questions that you've long held, or otherwise be of a positive influence to you, consciously or unconsciously. This is my intent, my kavana at this very moment. What I've just described to you is how thoughts are projected. Others might not be as nice a guy as I am, and they might not like you. They might be jealous of you. They might be jealous of your beauty or your handsomeness. They might be jealous of your money. They might be jealous of your power. And then they, that individual, projects harm to you. And that 
is what we call ayin hara, evil, right? The evil eye. Show with you a story that happened to me personally many years ago in New York City. Oh gosh, 30 years ago this might have been, a long time ago. At the time, when I was a single man, and again now, uh -huh, um, I was walking across the street in midtown Manhattan with a female colleague. And as we were crossing the street going this way, opposite, there was a very attractive woman walking opposite us. And I'm a guy, caught my eye, and you know, you notice this attractive woman. But where I was, my female colleague was in between. And I noticed her, she was looking at this woman as well. Forgive my choice of words, but I'll tell you exactly what she said. And I said, why are you looking at her? And she said, look at that bitch. She makes all of us look bad. I'm a little taken back by that. I never thought that women were that jealous to one another, but you know, you never learn. But then I heard uh, something happen behind us. That very attractive woman who was crossing the street behind us somehow had walked straight into a bus <laughs> and fell flat on the ground. She didn't see a bus. How do you not see a bus? And I stood and I questioned myself, saying, was that the eye in Hara? Was that the evil eye that I just saw in action? Did this female colleague of mine, through her malicious intent, project a negative thought onto this other individual because of jealousy? Maybe at the unconscious level, causing this poor individual not to see a bus and walk into it and bang? That is how the evil eye works. Understand that this is a psychological phenomenon and it's very real. And you and I are all, or let me rephrase, you and I can all be perpetrators of it, or you and I all can be victims of it. So how do I protect myself? Well, this is what I write about in my book, Protection from Evil. Bottom line is this. There's no magic solutions. If you want to wear what's called a hamsa, which is the symbol of the hand, my hand number goes like that, erotic blessing kind of stuff. But the, the hand itself is no magic. If you believe in it, then it gives you some semblance of peace and security, then that's a projection, okay? The item itself has no power, but your belief has power. When we talk about having faith in God, emunah peshuta, simple faith, this is the greatest defense against dark arts, against the occult, against the evil eye. You have to believe that you have strength. Techniques and tools are very simple. You know, I discuss in my book, and I'll give you a couple right here, right now, things that you can actually put into practice. Things that you've heard from many other sources as well. There are those who will say, visualize yourself encased in a ball of light. And the light that surrounds you at all sides is like bulletproof. And nothing can come penetrate it. That's all well and good. In our Kabbalistic tradition, we have something a wee bit stronger than that. We visualize the name of God, yud ke vav -ke. Whenever you get a feeling of or a sense of anything negative, just take a moment. Take a deep breath. Think about visualizing inside your mind's eye God's name. You know, the sheet is like I have here behind me. Yud, K, Vav, K. And use it as a projection of light to destroy any harm or negativity that comes to you. Practical example. You're in some type of an encounter with a negative individual. Could be a business meeting, could be any kind of an encounter. It doesn't have to be violent, it doesn't have to be angry, but someone you're getting in quote bad vibes from, real simple. Take the moment, take a deep breath so you can calm yourself, don't get all emotionally bent out of shape, and visualize in your mind's eye, Yud K Vav K, God's name. 
And then visualize projecting it out like beams of light from your eyes. Kind of stuff. Visualize the power of God neutralizing the effect of anything negative upon you. This has the psychological and the psychic effect of being able to neutralize that incoming negativity. How? Remember, the form and the force of negativity is coming from another human soul or a group of human souls, doesn't matter. You are going to the source from where all souls emanate and you are bringing down a higher power, a brighter, a, a, a brighter light. And by shining your brighter light, you therefore nullify anything else. So throughout my book, Protection from Evil, Rather than try to give you rituals and magic and hocus pocus, which are all just symbolic representations of, if you will, an expression of faith, I take you right to the source. Go to God. Don't think of God as a little old man with a white beard sitting on a cloud somewhere, please. Remember what God is. Remember what the name Yudkei means. Recently, Time dating now, it's uh, August, what is it, 2nd of August? Uh, I think it's 2nd of August, sorry. In 2018, I just released uh, publicly uh, a short little essay identifying what the name of God, Yudke Bavke, means. This is nothing new. Whatever I wrote in my essay, believe it or not, is, is based upon the teachings of Maimonides, again, in the Laws of the Foundations of Torah, Chapter 1. Go read it yourself. I recorded these revelations uh, in, in my book, my first book, Call Upon My Name, 25 years ago. So these, this information has been around for a while. It's important that we recognize that God is the energy field of the universe, the mind of the universe, the sentient consciousness, the active being of the universe. And the energy thereof is always here. You can never be far away from God. It is an impossibility. God, and that which we call God, is in every cell that makes up our physical body. It's the energy, the life force energy, with, which guides every subatomic particle. The Hebrew word for the divine presence is Shekhinah, which means the one who dwells, from the word Shochen, which actually means neighbor. It's the indwelling presence of God. In nature, the world around us, which we know is made up of atomic particles and subatomic particles. You've taken science classes, high school, college, remember? We talk about the makeup of the atom. You have a neutron and the protons, which make up the nucleus, and they are surrounded by you know, these orbits of electrons. The protons are positively charged, the electrons are negatively charged, and they balance out, right? Mon, Ben, yin and yang, male and female. And no one ever bothers to stop to ask, how does an electron know where it's supposed to orbit? How does an electron know that it's supposed to be negative? How does a proton know that it's supposed to be positive? Does it have any semblance of thought, consciousness, awareness? You go read Maimonides again in his Laws of the Foundations of the Torah, chapter three. He speaks of planets, stars, being conscious, sentient entities that are aware of themselves and they're aware of God. So Mother Earth is alive. Yeah, concept of the Shekhinah, Mother Earth, Gaia. That's Maimonides. Right? You don't get more Jewish than that. Well, that's true at the planetary scale. The cosmic scale is true at the subatomic scale as well. Somehow, somewhere, something in the laws of nature that dictates to the laws of nature what that, those laws are. So over the governed, there must be a governor. Right? This is that indwelling presence of God, the Shekhinah. And that connects and binds everything in the universe. So being that it's here, right here, 
You have access to it. All you need to do is focus on it. Call upon it. <laughs> my first book, Call Upon My Name, that was what it was all about. That's what here at the Kosher Torah School, we talk about our teaching, spiritual communion, spiritual connection. Just like I taught in the Sha'ari Kedusha courses, uh, I, I, I've taught those deep courses of spiritual communion and, and techniques of meditation to cultivate this awareness within us on a regular daily basis. See, the purpose of meditation isn't that you're just sitting back, closing your eyes and going off somewhere for an hour and open your eyes and come back to the world. No. Like in the words of the famous Chinese philosopher, Shuang Tzu, who stated that once he fell asleep and dreamed that he was a butterfly. And that dream was so vivid, so real, that when he woke up, he questioned whether indeed he was a male who dreamed that he was a butterfly. But maybe perhaps he's actually a butterfly who's dreaming he's a man. That's a pretty cool understanding of understanding this. We live in a world which we think is so real that there's a higher reality to it. And when we go off into a state of meditation, it is meant to expand consciousness, raise up levels of neshama, as we say, bring down a higher level of neshama. That's the way the Ari would describe it. This brings to us greater awareness, insight, and understanding of the world and the universe around us. When? For how long? 24-7. Your meditations should bring you insights. Your insights should be with you always. Real meditation is not done with your eyes closed. It's done with your eyes open. Real meditation isn't done when you're sitting down quiet. Real meditation is what you're doing every moment of every day. When you're making breakfast, doing laundry, sitting in traffic, busy at work, taking a test in school, your expanded consciousness grants you greater insight and wisdom to everything going on around you. This is the foundation of how psychic powers develop, where you can become aware of and sensitive to the feelings and thoughts of others, close and afar, the presence of, the existence of, the movements of things in faraway places, remote feeling. Ha, I mean, the sages did this all the time. The fact that governments would be interested in this today is nothing new from us. Nothing new under the sun in that respect. Yes, we have the power. You have the power. Evil is the projections of negativity from one human soul, be it incarnate in the body or not, onto other human souls. That's your definition of evil. God allows it to exist. Why? Because he's given us human beings the ability and the power of mind to build the bridges and create unity or to blow up the bridges and create chaos. And the, God has given us the ability to shine the light or not, therefore creating darkness. And so we can make the light shine or by the lack of it, allow evil to exist. Evil being the lack of consciousness, the lack of awareness. These things happen all the time. Our job is to overcome. So therefore, as a practical means of overcoming evil, you as an individual need to become more conscious, more sensitive, more aware of the presence of the feelings and thoughts of everything going on around you, from other human beings, flesh and blood bodies, other human souls, which may not be in flesh and blood bodies, or other entities out there that might be jealous of you for whatever reason. This is why, for example, in the Torah, our sages, very wisely so, created many, many laws to safeguard us psychically from negative, negative thoughts and projection. For example, we're always taught to be sanu'ah, which means modest, because 
when one is not modest, notice I'm not talking about women, right? They always jump to women. No, men and women both. When we downplay ourselves, we seek not to stand out, then we don't draw to ourselves negative and unwanted attention. But a lot of people, they will dress in certain ways, act in certain ways, which are for the sake of drawing attention. Well, you know what happens when you draw attention, just like a magnet. You will draw attention that you may want, but you will at the same time draw attention that you may not want. And you cannot control that. If you become a magnet, you don't get to pick and choose what metals are drawn to you. It doesn't work like that. So this is why our sages have always told us to be modest. Try not to stand out. This is a wise course of action. Everything that one does. Essentially, don't make yourself a target. It's really that simple. Duck. Cover. Be appropriately modest in things. If you open yourself up to anything negative, don't be surprised if that negativity enters into you. This is why we warn people over and over again about the three baddies, sex, drugs, rock and roll. I'm a good old listener to hard, heavy metal music, right? You come and drive with me in my truck, you're going to be listening to Deep Purple all the time, Highway Star, Smoke on the Water, and all the rest. Sex and drugs? Uh -uh. Anything that's going to open you up emotionally, psychologically, psychically, you become a target. You can become tapped. And when we speak of possession, something clings to your soul. No, it's not a little demon with a pitchfork. It's not like in that movie, what was it, The Exorcist. Many of you saw that, 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 that movie, The Exorcist. Oh, I forgot the little girls. What was it? Linda Blair, was that her name? Um, I hear that. I actually, believe it or not, I never saw the movie. I've seen pictures from it, but never the whole thing. But um, the film here in the United States is considered terrifying because people believe in this power of the devil doing these horrible things. In Israel, when people saw the movie, recognizing the, the fallacy and the foolishness of such mythology, the movie. Believe it or not, it was accepted as a comedy. Everybody was roaring in the other. It was the funniest thing they ever heard because they recognized how silly and foolish it was. We strip the power from the fear that is created by the mythology. We call that enlightenment. Shining the light. That is how we overcome evil. Being aware being strong in yourself and your resolve. When people are negative to you, you don't have to accept what they say. You just go, uh-uh, mm-mm. Uh -uh. The people offend you all the time. The people insult you all the time. Are there gonna be people out there who aren't gonna like you all the time? Who cares? In the wise words of good old Billy Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. The only one you will ever have to answer to is God. And if you are a righteous and decent and moral, good human being, and you're doing what's right, and you guard yourself carefully, evil will never find a place to penetrate into you, and you will always be safe. This is how we overcome evil. It's in our hands. It's not beyond us. You can pray to God, please, 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 God, move this, take it away from me. And God's going to say, I've already given you all the power and the skills to do it. Do it! God waits for us to act while we wait for God to act. And while we're waiting for God to act, God's waiting for us. Nothing gets accomplished. Nothing gets done. Symbolically speaking, it's like God sitting there with his arms folded and said, look, I already gave you what you need to do. Just go ahead and do it. Oh, please, God, would you do it for me? No, do it yourself. That's God's 
message to us. We have the power. We have the ability. I already taught you how to use God's name. Seal them up. Go and do it. There are negative forces around us all the time because human minds are full of negativity, especially in our so uh, controversial, the, 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 the heated society that we live in today. Everybody's so negative. Project for yourself light. Convince yourself of the truth of walking with God, being righteous and decent, building bridges, not burning them, making peace, not destroying peace. When you're doing what's right, the right will be with you. Like the verse says in Psalms, Ach tobe hesidir defumi. Surely goodness and mercy, the word is yir defumi, will run after you, meaning that will be drawn to you magnetically. You project good, good will come back to you. You project evil, harm to others, evil and harm is going to come back to you. In the East, they call that karma. We call it your goral. All right? That's just the way it is. What you put out is what you get back. The fum tsara agra. According to your investments, what you get, what you reap is what you sow, what you sow is what you reap. Yeah, that's it. So this is how we protect ourselves. If you think that you're going to put, for example, a mezuzah on the door, and the mezuzah will protect you, the mezuzah is a mitzvah of God. It's not a magical amulet. What it is, is what it is getting notes here that my battery is running out, so I'm going to have to close here. All righty, guys. Just remember, trust in God, have faith, do what's right, and God will bless. Let's conclude on that note. Again, I'm your host, Dario Barzadok. Thank you for joining me. God bless. Good night. Shalom. There we go.